we are live i like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today for mavericks first ever webinar mavericks is a jgu student organization that fosters promotes critical thinking logical data interpretation and coding mr rajagopal menon vice president marketing of wazirx will be the speaker for today's webinar wazirx is india's largest and most trusted crypto exchange with over 11 million users previously mr menon was part of a crack team that launched geo.com through which the company launched its 4g services and prior to this uh, prior to his geo stint he was the ceo of stepper.com india's number one dating company which was eventually acquired by tinder i would now like to hand over to mr menon to begin the session we all are keenly looking forward to learning a lot from today's webinar also i would like to request everyone to ask their questions at the end of the session over to mr menon thank you saloni for that lovely introduction and thank you ram for having me here uh, it's a great pleasure to come to uh, to come virtually to jindal uh, and speak to you guys about crypto um so uh, this presentation is actually uh, structured in such a way that uh, this is actually a crypto 101 for all of you all the idea is for you to get excited about crypto the way we are you know you'll sometimes you'll be wondering what the fuss is about crypto the idea of this presentation is not to go in depth into a lot of topics because uh, you know a michael saylor a, a very famous evangelist for bitcoin just said you know you need 100 hours of learning to understand even 10% of bitcoin um so i hope that uh, this presentation uh, triggers an interest in all of you to look uh, to read about this uh, understand it uh, you know to the best of uh, you can so without much ado i'll start my presentation straight away so this presentation what's inside this presentation fundamentally uh, what does is that it promises to reinvent money but to understand that we need to understand what money is uh, how money or, or finance has evolved over the years what is blockchain and how does it work what is crypto okay crypto is a very broad uh, term uh, there are some myths uh some case studies you know all of us think that uh, this is a instru crypto uh, and i'll be touching on uh, the next big things that are in this space that is happening here yeah so i'll start off with this video uh just let me know if you can hear this otherwise it's... oh oh So I don't think so. We can hear it. You can't hear? No, sir. Oh, oh. Okay. So, uh, this, so this, uh, I'll try and explain this uh, video to you. What it explains is that it explains the difference between currency and money. What currency is is that it's a medium of exchange. It's a store of. It's a. It's a unit of account. It's portable. It's durable, and it's divisible. and it is fungible that means you can transfer one unit of the currency to another it's interchangeable so money is all of this but it is also a store of value over a long period of time that is the fundamental difference between currency and money currency is used for transactions money has to have some value over a period of time so what i will so that is the fundamental difference between uh, currency and money now what is happening is that there is a lot of uh, evolution of money that happens and how currencies get debased so uh, just to give you a heads up uh, all our currencies were pegged to uh, gold the gold standard which went off in the 70s and now it gives governments the free uh, you know it uh, gives government a free ride they can print, print as much as currency as they want and this has exacerbated in the last uh 15 years starting off with the 2008 financial crisis where the governments 
actually printed trillions of dollars that is what led actually to this new entirely new uh, you know debate about debasement of currency so to fund to understand fundamentally money has to have a store of value but it as it exists today it is getting debased or it is what ha- what is happening is that inflation is eating away into its savings into your savings which is why it does not have a store of value so now we've understood money and we've understood what it does it should have a store of value which today's money does not but let's go back a little you know into the past the biggest innovations in finance according to me are first of all the double entry bookkeeping okay now double entry bookkeeping is actually uh, a, a, the most important concept in accounting and finance this was started by a gentleman called giovanni di medici okay the medici were a you know they were the one of the biggest bankers in italy uh, in the 1400s what he realized giovanni realized is that he needed because before that accounts were only you know they weren't double entry book, you know they, were, they weren't double entry there was only a single entry which led to a lot of errors so what he did was that he adopted the entire system of double entry bookkeeping to cut down on errors because italy was becoming a center of trade from you know the silk route where you know silk uh, you know from china a lot of trade was happening where silk clothes artifacts everything used to come from china and that was actually the foundation of modern banking as it exists today the second biggest innovation according to me was the issuance of shares of the british east india company so that was the first time a company went about actually an entity went about door to door raising money for its trading endeavors so actually representatives went across the length and breadth of england raising money for the british east india company for a for us you know for a promise of profit that was the second, that was according to uh, for most people the second biggest innovation and if you believe us the crypto evangelists today we believe that bitcoin and blockchain are are equally profound or as big as these earlier two innovations let's understand why so you've heard a lot what is blockchain what is a blockchain a blockchain is actually a public ledger it's nothing but a ledger but this ledger is is brilliant why is it so brilliant because it contains the the this ledger has a copy or every single transaction that has ever been completed and this is stored across the network every single node on the network has a copy of this ledger okay now how does this ledger get updated the ledger gets updated when miners actually compete to produce the next block so what it does is that how a next block is formed is that miners use extreme cryptography to actually uh, cryptography is a fancy for solving a very complex mathematical algorithm to solve and forge for the next block so let's understand this in a uh, in a uh, can you uh, can you, i'm sure i'm seeing that my internet connection is unstable i hope you guys can hear me ram can you hear me yes sir we can i i can hear you but i can't see the slide actually at least not here but on the youtube live i can see the slide but i can't see it here Uh, the slide so, you're sharing is it the blockchain or one what yes. is blockchain yeah, yeah what is blockchain i am able to see okay, okay cool then maybe we should yeah yeah so suppose i want to send money to a person i want to send money to ram what do i do it comes it, it the the entire transaction between ram and me is represented in a block it's one transaction in a block the block this transaction is actually uh, transferred is is actually broadcast to the entire network what happens is that the miners actually approve this network the miners actually do a very critical thing so what they do is that they decide whether raj has enough money in his wallet to actually pay ram and once they've established that they arrange all the sequences uh, they order, arrange all the transactions in in a sequence so they may they may arrange up to 100 transactions in a sequence in a block and then what they do is that they compete and solve a very major problem uh, it's called a cryptographic algorithm uh, it's a cryptographic uh, problem and once they solve it it's so all of them are competing to solve this problem so all of them so you know there's a mempool or there's a there's a you know a cloud sort of a thing where all transactions are there all the transactions so i might send money to saloni saloni might send it to someone else and then what happens is that all the miners are actually competing to forge the next block the guy who actually completes so the 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 block first or solves uh, or competes the algorithm successfully gets the right to forge the next block and that's how the next block is chained to the previous block 
and then the money goes and it's reflected from a to b and it's uh, from ram to from raj to ram and it's reflected across the network now if you look at why this is so critical is that you have to understand that today if i have to send money to ram what it does is that our banks do all this work the banks say okay fine raj has got enough money in <clears throat> in his bank account and then they deduct 100 rupees from raj's account and they transfer that 100 rupees to bank's account now imagine a world where there are no banks okay that's what blockchain does there has to be an entity that actually manages all of this together so that is what blockchains do really very beautifully now we've heard so i've just given you a flavor now again i'm i'm not getting into deep diving into what blockchain is all about you'll have to read about it extensively to understand it now blockchains are being used in today's world to a, a couple of major things one is that the maharashtra government is actually issuing uh, you know all the certificates your pcr certificates or your covid test uh, result certificates are issued actually on the blockchain what banks have done is that they've come together to form a company which is completely on the blockchain where all transactions uh will be on the blockchain and this is for actually processing letters of credit now people who understand business will understand that if you can solve this problem letters of credit because there is a lot of problems that happens in this actually sector there is uh, you know there's a lag there is a lot of fraud there is uh, a lot of you know time and effort goes into actually making sure that uh, you know the letters of credit are genuine uh, you know uh, the transactions have happened now blockchain solves for all of that so what is crypto crypto is actually so what is crypto crypto is actually the a cryptocurrency is actually the reward that miners get for actually forging the next block now blockchain or bitcoin actually uh uses a lot of solves a lot of problems which were not solved before together so you know uh, a lot of you know cash existed digital cash existed for since the 1980s but what makes bitcoin so special is that it solved all these problems together in by by a gentleman called satoshi nakamoto now what this does is that you cannot uh, in india the government has not yet classified it as an asset or a uh, or a security or a commodity so there is no so as of now we don't know what, how the government will classify it it's got no digital form there is no physical note there is no physical ledger it's completely decentralized and it is secured by cryptography so what it does is that you cannot actually break the network you cannot actually corrupt the network you cannot actually hack the network uh this graph is exactly the same thing that i had the diagram is exactly the same thing that i had explained before now there are some myths about cryptography about uh, about this entire space one is that it is illegal it's not uh it is definitely not illegal now the government has actually is actually going ahead and taxing us uh in this budget so you know uh, you are actually paying taxes on all the gains that you make uh it's used for illegal activities please understand that cryptocurrencies or crypto as cashits as we call them are money money can be used for good and evil and uh, the same is applicable for digital money you can use it either for good or for evil so you know whatever you can do with your with your 100 rupee note can also be done with bitcoin uh crypto will will uh, replace the indian rupee so this in india actually, actually we believe that we are not here to replace the rupee we are here to actually be a source of investment for indians the the entire place has has appreciated so dramatically that we want to give indians uh, you know a part of this entire revolution as it were it's very complex actually it isn't all you it's act, it's actually as simple as uh, you know buying sorry, anything on amazon all you have to do is download your wazirx uh, uh, you know application complete your kyc deposit money and you can buy bitcoin in just a click um crypto is not taxed of course you have to pay tax and this budget actually gives you clear guidelines on how you have to pay your taxes and bitcoin is the only crypto available in the market actually now there are about 10000 cryptocurrencies that are freely floating in the worldwide cryptocurrency market wazirx has listed about 200 of them uh you know if you're getting into crypto i would advise you not to go beyond you know the top 10 cryptocurrencies as a mode of investment for beginners when you see a one bitcoin cost 33 lakhs that you know today's price is i think 44000 us dollars you know all of us are shocked that means i can't afford it no actually you can you can buy cryptocurrency as low as 100 rupees i'll explain how 
another big uh, thing that is uh, labeled against the entire uh, industry is that it's a ponzi scheme a ponzi scheme is essentially you uh, the next person is a sucker but here what is happening is that it's uh, hordes and hordes of new investors are coming in and the existing investors are also still there so it's not a ponzi scheme and the second biggest criteria of a ponzi scheme is that there should be no value there is no value that is created but if you look at the market capitalization of bitcoin it is 1/10th now that of gold in and the and the bets are that in the by the end of by in the next few years it will overtake gold in terms of market capitalization so what is bitcoin actually bitcoin is peer to peer and anyone can participate in it so if you remember if you know pirate bay i'm sure all of us know pirate bay it's similar it's peer to peer right you know films are in are stored across many many computers here currency is stored across many many computers it enables you it enables you to securely store your value and transfer a value so bitcoin is actually made for only this thing it is only made for store of value and it is made for transfer of value so i can transfer if ram is in the states i can transfer 100 rupees 100 dollars worth of bitcoin to ram and it will reach him in a matter of 10 minutes no longer than that um it's fixed and transparent so as i mentioned before i alluded to it before you don't know uh, you know uh, what the inflation of you know uh, how governments are going about uh, you know inflating their currencies but bitcoin has a fixed inflation inflation steady schedule there will only be 21 million bitcoins ever produced and a bitcoin is mined every 7 and a half minutes um so there are approximately 19 billion bitcoin have already been mined now each bitcoin can actually be divided into 100 100 million satoshis so up to eight decimal points you can actually divide a bitcoin into so i've explained this how it works uh, you know if you if you want to transfer money i i won't go through this again so why is there so much hoo ha about bitcoin why is it so valuable first of all it is scarce so bitcoin is modeled on gold the the inflation rate of gold is actually very is fixed you know only 2% of gold new gold comes into the market and actually so bitcoin is actually modeled that way so you know that okay this many bitcoin will come into the market at this period of time and this can be verified by anybody if you have a simple desktop computer at home you can actually verify how the new how, how the how, you know the in the uh, inflation schedule of bitcoin now what happens is that the i explain mining to you and what these miners do is that they have mining farms actually stacks and stacks of computers dedicated to solving these complex algorithms to actually forge the next bitcoin so what it does is that bitcoin is actually using game theory to make sure that all actors on the network are incentivized not to go rogue so if you have to go rogue you, it's very difficult for you to actually you have to actually convince 51% of the network to actually do a proud you know if you want to forge a, a a particular transaction you have to actually take over 51% of all the network of all the computers that are running bitcoin uh, to actually forge your transaction which is now technically impossible no one can shut it down no country can take it over no person can take it over so as i mentioned before it uses game theory to actually protect its integrity and act in good faith now it is how is how is the price of bitcoin uh, determined it is simple market it's simple supply and demand new bitcoins are mined every you know there are about uh, 6.5 bitcoins that come uh, every uh, every uh, at the at uh, every block what happens is that the miners then leave this introduce this into the market and uh you know buyers and sellers actually the equilibrium between buyers and sellers determines the price of bitcoin it is so we've already touched upon this why it is so secure uh it it solves a particular problem called the byzantine generals problem so it's a very technical problem i'd urge you to read it up so now the beauty of bitcoin is that it solves a lot of complex problems in a very elegant way it solves a double spend problem so how do how does it assure how does it assume that raj cannot give the money to saloni and the same money to ram it as it assumes it uh, it solves it uh, by uh, you know it solves that problem it solves the problem of uh, you know uh, securing the entire network it solves uh, you know the it solves the entire problem through game theory so a lot of you know a lot of problems complex math problems that have been uh, you know hounding uh, scientists for years have been solved by bitcoin that is why that is that is why it is so it's such a technological marvel 
Um, also, it is censorship resistant. Now, we have seen that if uh, you know uh, entities can ban the president of the United States, can seize the can seize you know the assets of a, a central bank of a country, which has never been done before, as you know, never in the history, not even in the world was was uh, you know assets of a central uh, of uh, of uh, a reserve bank been seized so you're you're living in a very uh, in 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 gloriously uncertain times and no one can manipulate your your bitcoin so you know as long as you have control of your bitcoin no one can actually shut you out of the network no one can actually seize it from you um and actually it is the 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 actual the value of bitcoin comes from the digital scarcity you know you can you know how much is uh, you know uh, going out there in the market you know it's fixed and after 21 million no more bitcoins will actually be mined so if you look at uh, if you look at the uh, roi of bitcoin versus other traditional assets so you know you have bitcoin you have gold and you have the s&p 500 you can look at the rates of returns bitcoin on average has given you a 200 percent roi year on year for the last 10 years last the last year has been rocky but uh, over the over from the first year to the first to the the two from 2010 to 2020 21 it has on an average it's given you 200 percent roi every year compounded so now we have spoken about bitcoin let's also understand what are the other cryptocurrencies that are in the market today so you have the, this is the list of the top other of the top 10 cryptocurrencies that i have managed to put together the next big one is ethereum and there is tether there is bnb which is from binance there is uh, usdc there's xrp cardano solana terra and avalanche so these are the top 10 cryptocurrencies uh, in the market as i mentioned there are over 10000 of them so let's understand what ethereum is so as i mentioned to you before bitcoin was actually created to solve two specific problems store of value and transfer of value so what happened was that because you if now if you have programmable money you can the network decides that you can send money from one 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 person to the other the network and allows you to and enables you to do that what can why can't you do more stuff with digital money but bitcoin was built in a very minimalistic manner you cannot do a lot of things with bitcoin because as i mentioned it was made it was created to solve only two problems so a young russian scientist a young russian uh, teenager called vitalik buterin west had went about creating a new currency that uh, a new uh, technology actually that solved for problems that bitcoin couldn't solve uh, it was called ethereum and the programming language that he built was called solidity what it does is that it is a platform and it can power applications across uh it's uh, across the platform so you can build a blanking application you can build uh, you know a uh, 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 an exchange you can lend money why because ethereum is programmable and it works on something called smart contracts so the contracts so uh, the the way it works is that the con- it's a self running computer and uh again it does not have any centralized uh you know entity controlling it it's more than just payments as i mentioned there are a lot of applications that are being built on ethereum it's called the future of finance and it's a marketplace of financial services games and applications uh and a whole host of other things now you know you have nfts on it uh, and you have a whole host of other applications that are being built on it so if you use only payment uh, if you use ethereum suppose you know you, you want to uh, pay uh, using ethereum and if you look at it as only as a payment uh, you know device let's look at payment uh, let's look at how it is done how it's uh, fared as compared to paypal which is called the big daddy of uh, payments ethereum ethereum is close to double the payments of paypal with 0.2% of the headcount and it took and it did it and it did what paypal did in 25% of the time so you can just look at the numbers paypal does about 936 billion dollars of transaction ethereum does about 1.6 trillion dollars of transaction uh you know and the numbers are self explanatory so in just if ethereum went live in 2017 in just four and a half years five years it's been able to do what paypal did in you know the last 20 years so coinbase is actually one of the largest uh, cryptocurrency exchanges in the united states uh, similar to what wasirex does in india 
and coinbase against a centralized wazirx again is a centralized exchange you have an entity called wazirx which actually gets buyers and sellers together the next generation of exchanges are all uh, decentralized they are called dex you know decentralized exchanges and the biggest amongst them is something called uniswap uniswap now in just 4 years has processes 30% of coinbase's volumes at 27% of the headcount and at 2.5% of the funding that coinbase got so what uh the point i'm trying to dive home here is that uh you know that this wave of decentralization of finance actually removes a lot of layers of intermediaries bringing down the cost removing the time and makes it uh, you know cutting down on time and making it cheaper for everybody uh another big uh, case study here is actually is called the e is called the lending club or maker dao uh so lending club was one of the original uh, you know uh, uh, blue eyed boy of uh, uh, of uh, of wall street it it launched with a lot of fanfare but in 15 years it still make it still losing money maker dao is actually a dao a dao is a uh, is a decentralized uh, autonomous organization it has a it runs a stable coin and it's already profitable in just a handful of years so what is defi defi is actually software which is written on blockchain that makes it possible for peers to interact with each other it's peer to peer there is no intermediary in the middle and the software acts as the judge jury and executioner and it facilitates the transaction uh why is it why, why is it uh, superior to traditional finance because traditional finance is opaque it's complex and it's legacy so it's got a lot of overhead costs you know just to give you an example if you've gone for if you've applied for a loan you you know you have to run through the hoops actually to actually go you know to get a loan from uh, your favorite bank you know they ask you hundreds of questions they ask you to fill up thousands of forms um, and then you might not just not get the loan because it's uh, you know you don't meet their criteria it could be based on your surname your religion or whatever here this is actually defi what it does is that it's actually transparent it's fair it doesn't care who you are and in all probabilities no one knows who it is it's all uh pseudonymous so you know you don't go you go don't go about in this world actually saying that i'm rajkupal menon or i'm ram or i'm siloni you know you have you have uh, you know uh, your pseudonymous as in nobody knows your real identity so what what that does is that it makes it very fair it's inclusive you know uh, and it's less complicated uh, and it's far far more cheaper because uh, you know it runs everything is everything runs uh, on code the last and the biggest uh, thing that i would like to talk to you about is uh, something called nfts now we've heard a lot about nfts so what what are nfts actually nfts so you know digital coins are fungible right we just understood that one bitcoin is equal to another bitcoin but one nft is simply not equal to another nft it is simply digital art you know you know uh, people call it overpriced jpegs jpgs but that's actually not true what it does is that it runs on the ethereum blockchain and it has got a lot of extra information that makes it work so you can actually trace the provenance to it so if ram for or saloni uh, you know saloni has clicked a fantastic picture and uh, she decides to uh, you know sell it make it make it an nft mine it and you know so i can actually then buy buy it and then i sell it to ram the entire trace or the history of the transaction can be traced on that nft and what is beautiful in in this world is that saloni can will still get royalties even after even after the 100 transaction has happened so you know i could we could trade it multiple times and every time a trade happens saloni will still get a cut on the transaction and that is how the entire nft ecosystem is built now anything can be an nft it can be a photo it can be a doodle it can be drawing it can be art uh, you know it can be uh, you know 3d imagery whatever you know and uh, what this does is that it actually so if you if you spend some time trying to understand art uh, only the top 10% or you know actually the top 5% of artists make a lot of money and a lot of actually artists have to actually give up art to make an uh, to make an honest living but what nft does is that it democratizes the entire process you know imagine you know you are you could be a a, a worldly uh, painter you know somewhere sitting in in some tribal a- area of india and you could do all you have all you have to do is put your peer nft and people across the world can actually buy it from you uh 
Um, so what it does is that NFTs op- offer superior uh, economics to the creators. So right now, what is happening is that if assuming that you are, so you know, the, the easiest example that I can give you is YouTube, for example. If you're a creator on YouTube, YouTube gives 80% of the money. Only 20% of the money is given to you. So what NFT does is that it changes that completely. You get to keep all the money that you actually, you know, uh, for all the revenues that you actually create. So what does the future of uh, crypto actually look like? Uh, it was, it's in, in India, it's been a little rocky. There was an RBI ban that happened uh, in 2018. Uh, the Supreme Court then, uh, you know, overturned the ban. And finally, uh, you know, we heard that in 2021, the uh, RBI is launching, uh, you know, last year they announced that the RBI is launching a digital currency, a digital rupee. And it, it's come to a grand finale where the finance minister has just announced taxes on cryptocurrencies. So we've come a full circle where I think what is happening is that we are in the first stage of regulation of, of cryptocurrencies in India. Uh, I'd like to end with uh, what you guys can do to read all this, you know, to read up more. There is, of course, the Bitcoin white paper, which was created by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008-9. Uh, there is an entire course uh, available uh, on the MIT site. Uh, MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, it's called Blockchain and Money. And interestingly, the professor who created it is called Gary Gensler. He's the current chairman of the SEC. A bunch of interesting uh, YouTube channels. There is something called the Hidden Secrets of Money. So what I gave you was just one slide on the history of money or just a 30 second video, which unfortunately you couldn't see. But this entire uh, series talks about how money has evolved through the millennia. Uh, there is this really interesting book called The Bitcoin Standard by a gentleman called Saifuddin Amos. Uh, he is a, he's an engineer who trained as an economist uh, and he believes in hard money. It's an interesting concept. Look it up. And there are a bunch of others. On Twitter, you have to follow Naval. Uh, there is Balaji Srinivasan uh, and there is Chris Dixon. These are the guys who are the old gang of crypto. Uh, there are a lot of other people, but I've given you the you know, the fountain of knowledge when it comes to crypto. These are the guys that you need to follow when it comes to uh, cryptocurrencies. So I'm now open to questions. I know that this was uh, too much, a lot of, it was a dense presentation. It has, there were a lot of concepts in it, but the idea was not to dive deep into all these concepts. It was actually to, you know, trigger your imagination or trigger some interest in cryptocurrencies for you guys. I, uh, you know, I, I hope that, uh, some of you at least would look at this, uh, you know, this entire place, uh, this entire area uh, and read it up. Uh, it's it's a fascinating place and uh, all of us are very, very excited about the future of uh, cryptos. So over to you, Saloni. So, uh, before, uh, sorry, before Saloni, uh, you know, uh, sends the questions across or ask the question, uh, Raj, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for uh, condensing uh, uh, material worth of a wonderful semester course into, into uh, 35 minutes. Uh, so clearly there is a, a lot to learn from that. Uh, but just also to uh, you know, let you know that many of the students who are here, there are some faculty members who have joined on the Zoom call and there are more people on the YouTube Live as well. Uh, the students have all gone through uh, what, what's called as an emerging technology course. Even though they are all commerce and BCom students and uh, uh, BA students, they've all gone through an emerging technology course in which I talk to them about uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain uh, and fintech uh, over probably six or seven, maybe about 10, 12 hours of worth of lessons. Uh, so there is a little more meat to that, but clearly this is a good refresher for uh, most of them. I would say. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so this is just a revision. <laughs> so just wanted to provide that context as well. And there are some uh, uh, economists, uh, you know, uh, professors here on, on, the, on the call as well. So I just wanted to recognize that. So uh, mm, awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome. You, you guys are clearly uh, the avant-garde of, uh, uh, of technology and uh, finance. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're trying to do the best. Uh, because uh, many many of the students who have joined here are uh, pursuing finance and entrepreneurship. Uh, that's a BA in finance and entrepreneurship course. Several of them are uh, BCom honor students. So we are a mix of people, but they all have to go through understanding technology and how these uh, areas of finance is changing completely through technology. So yeah. 
Uh, awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah. uh, Saloni, uh, over to you, sorry. Yes, sir. So um, one of the questions that um, I think Asta is uh, asking is uh, why are famous Wall Street titans like Charlie Munger and Warren, uh, Warren Buffet against crypto cryptocurrencies? Um, see, uh, uh, there are no right and wrong answers about this. Uh, a lot of people make money depending upon their investment, you know, uh, philosophies. Uh, both, uh, uh, you know, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffet. Uh, Warren Buffet famously said he doesn't understand technology, and he did invest in a lot of technology stocks, uh, starting off with Google, uh, Facebook, and even Apple. And was someone else in his company who actually took the big leap into Apple. So they ha they are clearly, uh, you know, gods of uh, investing. Uh, but it was, uh, but what we believe is that, uh, you know, there is, this is the next, uh, this is the next wave of finance uh, and everyone is entitled to their opinion, right? Uh, you know, he, who, who, are, who are we to tell him, uh, you know, he's wrong. He's, he's actually the world's most uh, uh, successful investor, but time will tell, right? Uh, he has clearly uh, missed out on the Bitcoin bus. Uh, if you look at the returns that I pointed out to, uh, it's clearly, uh, a no-brainer to have been on Bitcoin, but he chose against it because of his philosophy. And he is successful because of his philosophy and uh, good for him. Um, I think next question is by um, Ahan. And um, just a second, yeah. So I think his question is, uh, what are your views on the 30% tax imposed on cryptocurrencies by the government? Um, you have to pay taxes, right? Uh, so what this government, so uh, I have no views because uh, the government decides the taxes and we have to pay up. Anyway, you have to pay 20% tax on, uh, on, uh, on all your gains if they are long term. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, if you make money, uh, you have to pay your taxes as a good citizen. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's as simple as that. Now it's law, right? There are, you, you can't do much about it. Uh, you know, if you make serious money, uh, which the government thinks all of us do uh, in the crypto space, uh, you know, we better pay our taxes. And most of us pay taxes. And in fact, a lot of us pay our taxes. Uh, and it's okay. But still, 10% is like quite more, like more than what you're paying on long-term or short-term assets. Yeah, but uh, so what, what, if you, I, I won't, I won't, I, I'll hesitate to, uh, you know, comment on this because, uh, uh, I've been warned by my legal team that a lot of details are still awaited. So I will not be able to uh, go into detail on this. But uh, I think all of us should be okay. You know, you make a lot of money, why not pay taxes? <laughs> okay, why not? It's as simple uh, as that. I'll, uh, Dave, uh, please ask a question. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation, sir. I'm Dave Doshi. Uh, you know, amidst the, you know, we're witnessing... Uh, the Russia and the Ukraine war recently. And uh, during this time only, uh, cryptos have fallen, especially Bitcoin fell by to 35,000. And whereas gold rose, even during the COVID crisis, we saw Bitcoin falling and uh, gold and rising. So you, you, we've talked about geopolitical events, inflation, that it being a hedge, but certainly in these scenarios, it's not a hedge. Can you just elaborate a bit on more? See, uh, I think uh, uh, I think Rakesh Junjanwala has said something beautifully. You know, uh, markets are like women. You know, always mysterious, uh, always alluring, uh, and, and you don't know, and you don't know how they are going to react. So, uh, you know, the crypto market is exactly like that. Nobody, anyone who tells you that Bitcoin should hit a hundred thousand or Bitcoin should uh, cross fifty thousand or whatever. Nobody knows. At best, what everyone is doing is they are making educated guesses. There is this very famous uh, analyst who's called Plan B. So he's a he's a he's a hedge fund manager, investment banker, uh, and he has this uh, fantastic market. It's called it's a, a, a model. It's called stock to flow. Till uh, October two thousand twenty one, his model was brilliant. But after uh, after October two thousand twenty one, and he had predicted Bitcoin will touch hundred thousand by Christmas twenty twenty one. And he was right till then. Okay, he you know uh, till that time he was right. But after October 2021, the model went you know Bitcoin did that 66,000. But after that, it's crashed. So nobody knows how markets react. Whether it's the stock markets, whether it's the crypto markets, uh, you know nobody knows. So uh, the only way that most of us can actually uh, you know uh, the easiest way actually for all of us to 
uh, actually benefit from these markets is a concept called dollar cost averaging you, or, or systematic investment plan. Buy a certain amount of crypto uh, that you that you have actually researched. Keep buying it over a period of time. And by the way, this is not financial advice. Uh, I'm not uh, here to give you financial advice and uh, do your own research. But that's the easiest way to actually average out your costs. And that's the most sensible way to go about it. And, you know, it's like, you know, there's a Hero Honda ad way before your time. So it's called fill it, shut it, forget it. Just keep buying. Uh, interestingly, there is this uh, brilliant article I read, uh, a paper that I read, you know, some time ago. The most, the people who made money in investing, okay, common people like you and me, are people, you know, who have forgotten about their investments. So it could be some inheritance that you got and you put it in some mutual fund or in some stock. And after 15 years, you suddenly realize, oh God, I, I put money here, let me look at it. So don't, so you just forget about it and, uh, you know, just let it grow. And after a period of time, you have a look at it. And hopefully you would have made some money. I hope I answered your question because there are no right answers to your question. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. So um, I think Ahan has a, uh, another question. So Ahan and then Himam. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So I would like to ask you that uh, what are the impl what might be the implications of the introduction of digital rupee in India, and how can it affect banks in India? How will it affect when it's introduced? So what is your take on this? Because I have seen numerous debates on this. But I was not able to fall to a conclusion. So that is why I would like to hear your perspective. See, there are two ways of looking at it. Okay, uh, India is already an advanced digital economy. We we, pre we process trillions of transactions using the uh, you know the Aadhaar network. So there, uh, you know, actually this makes sense. Uh, the West is actually behind us when it comes to technology or payment infrastructure, and this is all happening at zero cost. UPI is actually zero cost. So it makes sense, uh, you know, a digital, you know, uh, the entire uh, uh, discussion would merit some, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, debate in the West where they don't have any infrastructure in place. Now, the second point that I would like to tell you is that the only country that has made some progress with respect to, uh, you know, digital cu currencies or digi sovereign digital currencies is China. And they've started rolling out their uh, pilot programs. India has announced it. But there are a lot of questions to be answered. So then, how, what are the what is the role of banks? You know, then you don't need banks, right? For the RBI can just roll it out, and then uh, you know it, it moves it moves directly from uh, you know the it eliminates the banks completely out of the out of the picture. So uh, I run I, I work for a cryptocurrency exchange, and I know how difficult it is to get you know to put a team behind it and roll it out and understand the implications. So I think that it will take some time for it all to roll out. Already, what is happening is that through your direct debit system, a lot of the problems that uh, you know uh, are already being met beautifully through you know targeting of uh, you know the Aadhaar beneficiaries. So we'll have to wait and see what the uh, what RBI wants to do with it. But uh, it can help banks uh, do a lot of intra settlements uh, very effectively. Also, I'd like to tell you that uh, you know blockchain is not the solution for everything. You know, nowadays you hear that hey, blockchain Sometimes centralized solutions are beautiful. So, you know, a lot of private enterprises don't need actually need blockchain solutions. Uh, blockchain, you know, could be used in certain scenarios where you need decentralization, you need transparency, you need, uh, you know, uh, a robust protection. But uh, not all, uh, you know, it's like trying to uh, uh, hammer in, uh, you know, a, a nail with a sledgehammer. You don't need to do that. All you need is a a simple solution, centralized solution will do. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Hemant, you can go ahead. Uh, sir, comes up, sir you said that uh, cryptos are illegal by the, so now the government has imposed taxes. But at the same time, uh, Nirmula Sitamaraman, our finance minister, also said that cryptos are not uh, legal right now. Yeah. So, 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 what's so, what your... is, so, so what is happening is that uh, they are going to announce a new bill. Actually, there's an entire cryptocurrency bill that is in the annual that is going to be in introduced. We think that it's going to be introduced some, sometime. Uh, this, I think someone has to mute their... Can you hear? Uh, uh, Ram, Ram, sir, please mute your mic. It's a nice yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
so uh, what happens is that uh, what was your question again i'm sorry i lost my train of thought Nand, can you please uh, repeat your question? So my yeah, question. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember whether it is an, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, now uh, there is an entire crypto bill that is going to be tabled in Parliament, where a lot of questions will be answered. Is it an asset? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? And so on and so forth. Uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, from what we hear, the gov and it is very evident that the RBI. Does not like cryptocurrencies. You know, uh, the governor has been on record saying that multiple times. Uh, what the government is doing is that it is walking a fine line. Uh, it and it uh, and uh, the good thing is that this government is very practical. Uh, it needs to shore up its revenues, and it's looking at crypto as a means to, uh, you know, enhancing its tax revenues. So I don't think a ban or anything that dramatic is around the corner. What they've done is that they're trying to regulate it. Uh, Uh, and this is just the first step. Uh, so it's not legal. It's certainly not illegal. Uh, it was never illegal, by the way. So uh, I'm I'm sure that the status of cryptocurrencies will be uh, will be out soon and and will be defined. So you know there has to be a definition for any uh, uh, any law to come into place, and that will happen sometime soon, uh, as early as this year, later this year. Yes, sir. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so let me ask uh, a little more uh, broader question in terms of uh, uh, how uh, the, the, the the central bank digital currencies that is going to come into play uh, fundamentally and philosophically it is again driving away from the concept of cryptocurrency, right? And it seems like a play by governments across, whether it is from China or whether it is in the U.S. or whether it is in India. uh they seem to be fighting the whole construct of uh, cryptocurrencies yes. and uh, so from that perspective uh is it uh, uh is it uh, is it uh, is it actually curtailing innovation in many ways and going to impede uh, how the whole decentralized structure and uh, whether it is defi or daos how that's going to actually get uh, impacted uh, because of uh the government intervention in some in many ways uh because in the last 10 10 12 years we have seen a lot of these innovations coming across uh and driving um, the aspects of uh, you know not just blockchain but in the, all the surrounding applications uh but with uh, with the cdbcs coming into play and uh, uh, central governments wanting to centralize their control and power Is that going to have a negative impact in terms of how this is going to progress? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so uh, uh, it is the right. I don't think any uh, state in its right mind will give away the power to issue currency. So it it's uh, it it's a no brainer, right? No no state will ever do that. Um, what so what they've decided, uh, in my opinion, is that they've figured it out that this is an innovation that they cannot be left out of, and they have to be in it. now uh, how it all pans out uh, you know uh, we don't know but i think a lot of good will come out of it because uh, the central pillar of decentralized finance or defi as you know is stable coins uh, now if you have a digital rupee it becomes and it is it is issued by the government of india it automatically becomes a stable coin right you don't have to trust a private corporation and you know the troubles that tether is going through uh, you know uh, so it it will solve a lot of problems but how it will all pan out is uh, is anybody's guess so uh, you know the stable coin uh, conundrum is is a, is one that a lot of people are grappling with and i think uh, you know this uh, this entire uh, puzzle can be solved using a digital uh, a digital rupee or a digital dollar uh, as it as it happens but uh, uh, you know uh, yes they they you can't blame governments for uh, you know being a little worried because uh, you're it's it's loss of control right and in a country like india where anyway there is so much uh, black money uh, you know the, the government is has its uh, there is some merit in the government government's policy of you know uh, 
you know an, uh, you know a, a parallel economy starting again through crypto so what they doing is that they are giving us space to grow but at the same time keeping you know uh, uh, like a naughty boy keeping you know the class teachers keeping a very close eye on it that's the way i'm looking at it from uh, from what i see you know things could change dramatically you know uh, a week is a long a day is a long time in crypto as as you know so i i have a, another question as well uh about 3 years back uh, when i was teaching the course on uh, emerging tech and talking about cryptocurrency and bitcoin uh, one of my students at that time uh, said uh, sir i am already trading in bitcoin and he said i have you know 0.001 share or cent or something like that of uh, bitcoin uh, so the question is uh, do you find within wazirx i don't know whether you have done the necessary demographics uh, uh, and sociographic uh, you know profiles uh, do you find there is more of the millennials and the post millennials that who are more uh, involved in cryptocurrencies than uh you know the the 30 plus and the 40 plus uh, individuals yeah I, but, did you find that uh, significant difference and is there a, the, the, the the thing the other corollary to that is is that uh, are they treating it more as a play thing uh, and actually taking a more risky approach to the investment and uh, uh, not necessarily looking at value investing and you know, the traditional way of thinking about investments and and then just focus on okay let's get some make some quick buck uh, and uh, you know with the herd herd mentality coming into play right so is there some of that going on uh, so any thoughts on that yeah, yeah. so uh, your first question is uh, on the profile of users so interestingly you are right uh, wazirx is at about 12.5 million users chunk of our users are below 30 uh, so, uh, you know, we are at India is a very interesting country. We skip, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we skip technology. So we missed, we, we skip the landline, we went straight to mobile. Uh, we skipped the desktop internet, we went straight to mobile internet. Uh, similarly, uh, a lot of these young guys are actually uh, skipping the traditional, uh, you know, stocks. Not, I won't say stocks, but, you know, PPFs uh, and jumping straight into crypto. Uh, and you can't blame them, right? You hear the, you know, you hear all these stories. Of, every day you see some new new story about Bitcoin and you know how it's giving you uh, crazy returns and Elon Musk, you know, his crazy tweets uh, and so on and so forth. Yes, so millennials uh, form a bulk of our users. Uh, interestingly, women uh, and you know a lot of women are actually uh, getting into crypto in a very very big way. And you know the theme of crypto is all about uh, uh, all about financial empowerment. Uh, and uh, you know it's 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 beautiful that you know women are taking to it like nobody's business. The other insight that we have is that growth is not restricted to you know prosperous centers like you know Mumbai, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, or something like that. Growth is coming from places like uh, you know Ranchi, uh, Charkand, uh, you know places that you and I wouldn't even think about. Meerut, uh, you know hinterland of India. That is where actually people are actually getting into crypto in a very very big way. So the younger guys actually are driving it. The ticket size is low, but you're also having a lot of savvy investors, you know, the 40 year olds, you know, gray head people like me, uh, actually diversifying their portfolios. So we are, we might be small in number, uh, the older guys, but the size of our portfolio is, uh, or the average investment or the ticket size is much bigger. But you're right, a lot of uh, investors are coming in, youngsters are coming into crypto. Uh, regarding your question about uh, returns, yes, uh, uh, one gets the sense that uh, a lot of people are in it to make a quick buck. Uh, but who are we to stop? You know, like there are penny stocks uh, in every market and, uh, you know, uh, and in every bull market, uh, you know, the, a sign of a bull market is when the penny stops, the penny uh, stocks start doing crazy things. So like likewise, uh, you have the Shibas and the jo Doges here, which attract a lot of investors. But eventually what happens is that a lot of them then graduate to, uh, you know, the learning is really very quick and crypto markets are, uh, you know, a very, very stern teacher. Your lessons are learned very, very quickly. And then uh, most of them gravitate to uh, the better coins. And likewise, on the crypto exchanges itself, uh, uh, while there are probably, you know, what are 8,000, 10,000 active, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, there are a good number of probably of 600, 700 different exchanges around the world, right? So are they also uh, 
or some exchanges uh, more uh, uh, going to be more stable than others uh, in terms of how they operate. Binance and others, you know, typically have been the ones that have been touted. But uh, are there other specific exchanges that are going to get uh, more prominent? Um, so there is an exchange for everybody. So depending upon your need, uh, there is an exchange for it. So there are peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Uh, there are exchanges that don't do KYC. There are fly-by-night operators. There are exchanges that trade, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, questionable cryptos are listed. Uh, so depending upon your, your, your uh, you know, outlook towards crypto, you'll find an exchange that, that fit best suits your needs. But uh, Binance is the big daddy of them all. Uh, we all know that. By Bazirex is, by the way, is a Binance company. Uh, and uh, the the way we look at it is that all exchanges in India, at least the the big ones, you know, there are about four big, three big exchanges, and there are about fifteen smaller exchanges. We follow best practices. Uh, so you know, we have KYC. Uh, we make sure that uh, you know AML uh, and anti money laundering norms and all are followed. Um, so you will find less flexibility with us, but uh, more stableness. And uh, what and now uh, I think what has happened is that uh, you know uh, a basic level. It is like the wild, wild west, but a semblance of order is coming. So uh, I wouldn't say that a Mount, Bok, Mount Gox sort of a thing won't happen again. You should never say never. But things are a lot better now because you have hot wallets, cold wallets. Your, your, all your uh, you know, cryptos are never kept on, on the exchange. They're all, often taken offline. A bunch of measures that most exchanges, at least the good, well, better run ones follow uh, and ensure that, your, that, crypto, that cryptos are, uh, are safe. But uh, for all of you out there, you know you're uh, a more savvy a lot. Uh, if it's not your crypto, if it's not uh, your keys, it's not your crypto. So just make sure that you have control of your crypto and have uh, full custody of your crypto. Thank you. So I think that's it for the questions. But I'd like to thank you, sir, for sparing the time from your busy schedule and gracing us with your presence. I'm pretty sure all of us were able to learn a great deal of things today. So thank you so so much. Um, yeah. Thank you, Saloni, and thank you, Ram. I hope uh, you know you guys uh, find a good career in crypto because this is the future again. Definitely. Cheers. Bye. Thank, thank bye. you very much for your time, you so Raj. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.